And now if you're able to find a Bible, we've got Bibles here in the book racks in front of you. We're going to be in Lamentations chapter 4. Lamentations chapter 4. And in the Bibles that we have here, Lamentations chapter 4 starts on page 709, 709. So what I'll do, and this is what we do every week, I read from the Bible, I read the passage on the front end, we pray, and then we work our way through as a church, believing that God's word is powerful and effective and and helpful for us to live our lives productively for his glory. So let's read Lamentations chapter 4, starting in verse 1. It goes like this. How the gold has lost its luster, the fine gold become dull. The sacred gems are scattered at every street corner. How the precious children of Zion, once worth their weight in gold, are now considered as pots of clay, the work of a potter's hands. Even jackals offer their breasts to nurse their young. But my people have become heartless, like ostriches in the desert. Because of the thirst, because of thirst, the infant's tongue sticks to the roof of of its mouth. The children beg for bread but no one gives it to them. Those who once ate delicacies are destitute in the streets. Those brought up in royal purple now sit on ash heaps. The punishment of my people is greater than that of Sodom, which was overthrown in a moment without a hand turned to help her. Their princes were brighter than snow and whiter than milk. Their bodies more ruddy than rubies, their appearance like lapis lazuli. But now they are blacker than soot. They are not recognized in the streets. Their skin has shriveled on their bones. It has become as dry as a stick. Those killed by the sword are better off than those who die of famine. Racked with hunger, they waste away for lack of food from the field. With their own hands, compassionate women have cooked their own children, who became their food when my people were destroyed. The Lord has given full vent to his wrath. He has poured out his fierce anger. He kindled a fire in Zion that consumed her foundations. The kings of the earth did not believe, nor did any of the peoples of the world, that enemies and foes could enter the gates of Jerusalem. But it happened because of the sins of her prophets and the iniquities of her priests, who shed within her the blood of the righteous. Now they grope through the streets as if they were blind. They are so defiled with blood that no one dares to touch their garments. Go away, you are unclean, people cry to them. Away, away, don't touch us. When they flee and wander about, people among the nations say they can stay here no longer. The Lord himself has scattered them. He no longer watches over them. The priests are shown no honor, the elders no favor. Moreover, our eyes failed, looking in vain for help. From our towers we watched for a nation that could not save us. People stalked us at every step. So we could not walk in our streets. Our end was near, our days were numbered, for our end had come. Our pursuers were swifter than eagles in the sky. They chased us over the mountains and lay in wait for us in the desert. The Lord's anointed, our very life breath, was caught in their traps. We thought that under under his shadow we would live among the nations. Rejoice and be glad, daughter Edom, you who live in the land of Uz. But to you also the cup will be passed. You will be drunk and stripped naked. Your punishment will end, daughter Zion. He will not prolong your exile, but he will punish your sin, daughter Edom, and expose your wickedness. Let's pray. Lord, we're asking for your help right now as we've opened up your word. We pray that by your spirit, through your word, you would show us why you have given us these words why you put this in your Bible, why it's important for us today. So, Lord, we're asking that you would help, please, in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week, we were in chapter 3, and right in the heart of the book of Lamentations, there are five different poems, and the third one is right there in the middle. And in the heart of it, we found that the writer was able to, to draw hope as he considered the character of God. It kind of dawned on him that God is a good God, and he is a gracious and compassionate God, who does not afflict from the heart. And it was good news, and it gave us a glimmer of hope in the midst of a very dark and depressing book. And there's a part of me that wishes he would have ended there. 
right? We got through the 33 verses of, uh, of chapter 3. There was a bunch more. It goes 66 verses in chapter 3, but it was a hopeful note there, and it almost just felt like, well, let's just wrap it up then. But then we have to work our way back out of this experience of lament, and so we get the remainder of chapter 3 and then uh, chapters 4 and chapter 5. And, and um, Christopher Wright put it like this. He's an Old Testament scholar, and he, he wrote this. He said, Hope may lie in the future, which is what we found in chapter 3, that the goodness of God can maintain us in the midst of difficulties. So he says, hope may lie in the future, but the present is unrelieved agony, and it must be voiced and heard. Lament is not yet exhausted. And what this reminds us of is the fact that even though we can place our hope and our confidence and our faith in the character of God and in his goodness, when you are going through the difficulties of life, when you are suffering, there is permission here. I would say it's appropriate, maybe even necessary, to work your way through the process of lament. It's something that we need, and God has given it to us here in his word. He's given us this biblical language of lament. And so here we go. We're going to look at chapter 4 now, and we're going to look at it under three headings. Degradation, devastation, and limitation. Degradation, devastation, and limitation. Verses 1 to 10, we see this people that have been degraded, that have been uh, demoted. And you're like, why didn't you just use that word? Why'd you use the weird one? Um, but hopefully uh, you'll remember it. Uh, but this, it's this idea that the people who once were so privileged, that once had such an amazing status with God, have now experienced a demotion of sorts. Let's look at it in verses 1 and 2. It talks about it in terms of a metaphor of precious items and those items losing uh, the obviousness of their value. Look at verse 1. How the gold has lost its luster. The fine gold become dull. The sacred gems are scattered at every street corner. And this is metaphorical language talking about the populace, talking about the people, and it's saying that gold, though incredibly valuable, has now become so covered with filth that you can't, you can't perceive the value of this item. And the gems are scattered at every street corner, and it's talking not just about these uh, precious gems and this gold, it's talking about people. Look at verse 2. How the precious children of Zion, once worth their weight in gold, are now considered as pots of clay, the work of a potter's hands. These kids that were born in this place, they once had an incredible privileged status, but now they are common. They are demoted. They, they've experienced a devaluation, um, which, which is so surprising. The Bible tells us that the people of God are God's treasured possession. Out of all of creation, it's all his, but he looks at his people and he's able to say, this is my portfolio. This is my value. This is the thing that I most cherish. It's the people. And they have historically experienced that favor and that blessing. In fact, in Psalm 87 verse 6, it, it, it gives us this kind of depiction of, of how incredible it is to be born into the people of God. In Psalm 87 verse 6, it says, the Lord will write in the register of the peoples, this one was born in Zion. To be able to say of a child, you belong to the people of God, is a tremendous privilege and an advantage. But here we find in the wake of the experience of the people of God in this time and in this age, the, the precious children are like clay, the work of a potter's hands. They have experienced a degradation. And that results in inhumanity as people begin to look at other human beings and they don't perceive the dignity and the value there you, you find these expressions of injustice. So verse 3, even jackals offer their breasts to nurse their young, but my people have become heartless like ostriches in the desert. He says, what, what's going on now amongst this community is they are so degraded that they're mistreating even their young. And they're looking on these children and they're doing these expressions of of inhumanity, and he says, and by way of comparison, the desert jackals are doing a better job caring for their youth. Desert jackals are nursing their young, but my people, my people have become heartless. 
And what it's saying is that the people have fallen so low that they look even on their kids and they, they cannot perceive the glory that's right before them. And they're mistreating and abusing their own kids. Verse 4, because of thirst, the infant's tongue sticks to the roof of its mouth. The children beg for bread, but no one gives it to them. The children are suffering in this experience. Those who were once royalty are now stripped. Verse 5, those who once ate delicacies are destitute in the streets. Those brought up in royal purple now lie on ash heaps. It's saying those who you, you would notice before and they were, their outfits were incredible and their diet was incredible and everything that they were doing was incredible, but now you find them lying in the streets on ash heaps. And he's saying this is what's going on with the people they have been degraded. Verse, verse 7 and 8, their princes were brighter than snow and whiter than milk their bodies more ruddy than rubies, their appearance like lapis lazuli, but now they're blacker than soot. They're not recognized in the streets. Their skin has shriveled on their bones. It has become as dry as a stick. There, there are these individuals who were nobility, and previously you could look at them and you would see their, their garments, and they were like lapis lazuli, which is a deep blue gemstone. So you would see their outfit and you'd go, okay, this person's wealthy, this person's doing quite well. And you could notice that, and you would look at their skin, and their skin was healthy and vibrant and, and all these different things. Um, and, and you would look at their bodies, and they were physically fit and ruddy and muscular and filled out and all this, this stuff. But now you look at them, and they look, they look disgusting. They look filthy. They look worn down. Um, I don't know if you've seen the videos online where, you, where people will take, a, let's say, a homeless individual, and then they give them a makeover, they cut their hair, they put new clothes on them, they give them a shave and all these different things, and you see this progression of you, you know, going from somebody in the streets to somebody who looks very respectable and, and handsome and all these different things. This is the reverse. This is the exact opposite. This is the people going from prominence and wealth to the situation of lying in ash heaps. The writer makes a comparison in verse 6, and he says, the punishment of my people is greater than that of Sodom, which was overthrown in a moment without a hand turned to help her. As he considers what's going on and he thinks about the difficulty of the moment, he goes, you know what? Sodom had it better than we did. And Sodom was a city in the book of Genesis that was known for being wicked and God poured out judgment on Sodom in, in real time. He poured fire from heaven and, and destroyed the people. But Sodom was a, was a location where uh, Abraham kind of bartered with God, if you guys recall. And Abraham said, will you really destroy this city if there are righteous people who live here? And God says, for sure, I will do that. And, and they have this conversation, and he keeps you know, saying, but, but what if there's only this many? And he just keeps lowering the number, lowering the number. And eventually God reveals that uh, this city is under his judgment and he pours out wrath on it. Now, the writer in Lamentations is saying, they had it better than we do. Um, he says, the punishment of my people is greater than that of Sodom, which was overthrown in a moment without a hand turned to help her. How is it that you could compare those two and say, we have it worse than Sodom. And I think the answer is, we knew better. We knew better. As the people of God, we had access to the words of God and the promises of God and the covenant of God, and we neglected it to our own peril. They had the experience of the judgment of God, and they had it coming. They didn't know any better, but we foolishly neglected the things of God and suffered on account of it. So he evaluates and and it's awful. Uh, it's, uh, you, the, the language here, there's no way around it but to kind of shudder at what is being described here. Verse 9, those killed by the sword are better off than those who die of famine. Racked with hunger, they waste away for lack of food from the field. He says, if somebody got the better deal, it's the people who went out to fight and got struck down. That was better than the people who were left in the city to starve to death. And then he says, and what I saw, and we, we should really wince at this one. He says, what I saw is unthinkable. The gentlest of women have resorted to cannibalism. And we see that there in verse 10. With their own hands, 
Compassionate women have cooked their own children, who became their food when my people were destroyed. So in verses 1 to 10, we have this picture, and it is the picture of a privileged people experiencing incredible degradation, going from glory and falling from that glory and finding themselves in this situation of just incredible awfulness and despair. And as I think about it, it's a warning for us, right? Why did God put this here? What does this mean for us? And one of the things that I think this should do is it should make you sick to your stomach. It should make you sick to your stomach as you read the events that happen to these real people. You should feel woozy about it. You should feel an unease about it. And you should also recognize then that if that is what sin amounts to, I want nothing to do with it. If that is what sin results in, then I want absolutely, I want to be nowhere near it. And I do believe that the people of God should take that warning quite seriously. But secondly, we see this devastation in verses 11 to 20. The devastation is explained for us here in verses 11 to 20. So if verses 1 to 10 kind of uh, tell us what happened, verses 11 to 20 tell us more or less why it happened. So verse 11, the Lord has given full vent to his wrath. He's poured out his fierce anger. He kindled a fire in Zion that consumed her foundations. He's not mincing words here. He's being very direct and very clear. The Lord has poured out his wrath and and his fierce anger. This surprises everybody, the residents of the place, but also the nations that are looking on. Verse 12, the kings of the earth did not believe, nor did any of the peoples of the world, that the enemies and the foes could enter the gates of Jerusalem that enemies and foes could enter the gates of Jerusalem. It surprises everybody. Why is that? Well, because if this is the people of God, God historically has cared for them. He's looked after them. So whenever anybody threatens them, they have to reckon with the fact that the living God is on their side. And they've seen it multiple times in, in history. One example, for instance, is way back when Hezekiah was the king, and Sennacherib comes up and he goes, I'm going to wipe you guys off the face of the planet. And if you think your God can protect you from me, you've got, you've got some news coming. And he threatens them, and he tells them, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to come in. I'm going to destroy everything. You are not safe here. And Hezekiah and Isaiah take that note that was written to them. They bring it into the temple, and they spread it out, and they pray. And they go, God, we're looking to you. Yes, this king has threatened other nations and demolished them, but we're looking to you. You are our God. And God tells them quite plainly, I got this one. And that king and his army are, are done. And the people of God have to do nothing except for observe the faithfulness of God. So now the kings of the earth and the peoples of, of the world, they're looking at this and they're going, how did this happen? How is it that the enemies and the foes of the people of God marched right into the gates of Jerusalem? This this is unprecedented. How how did this happen? How did they fall from, from such glory? How did this occur? And we're told in verse 13. It's a damning passage, but it reads like this. It happened because of the sins of her prophets and the iniquities of her priests who shed within her the blood of the righteous. How did this happen? The spiritual leaders failed to do their jobs. The priests and the prophets sinned against God. This is a startling passage because what it's saying is that spiritual leadership can be for you one of two things. It can either be a tremendous blessing to you. Spiritual leaders can tell you what you most need to hear. If they're faithful to God, they will commit themselves to it. They, they will tell you what you need, even when you don't want to hear it. Jeremiah is a good example of this. Jeremiah had a ministry of warning people, and nobody wanted to listen to him. But he was faithful, and he was telling them, you guys better, you, you better return to the Lord, and if you don't, here are, the, here are the consequences of that. Faithful leaders can be a tremendous blessing to you. But here's a, a very, very startling thing. Um, spiritual leaders have the ability to be a terrible liability for you if they are unwilling to tell you what God wants to say. Uh, 
the principle, I think it runs throughout Scripture, but you see that the spiritual well-being of the people really rises or falls on the, on the condition of the spiritual leaders. And so as we consider this and we recognize how did this happen, and we're told in verse 13, it's because, it is because the leaders sinned against God and they shed innocent blood. They shed within her the blood of the righteous. Now, I don't believe that the priests and the prophets were actually violent here. I think this is metaphorical language. Um, I think what it's saying is because they failed to do their job, then the blood of those people are on their heads. And so I'll give you an example of this from the New Testament. The Apostle Paul gathers a group of people together. It's the elders of the church of Ephesus. This is Acts chapter 20. And he pulls them together, and he's reminding them of his public ministry. And he says, you guys, you saw me, you observed me, you watched my character and my conduct, you saw the things that I gave myself over to, uh, you, you know, so you guys know. And I, I'm about to leave, and I'll never see you again. But you know that I did my ministry with a, with a very deliberate intentionality. And then he says this very incredible thing. He says to them, I am innocent of the blood of all of you. Your blood will not be on my head. And he says, here's why. Because I did not hesitate to tell you everything that you needed to know. I did my ministry in such a way that I, in a clear conscience, can say, I told them all that God instructed me to say. And, and he, um, he did that because he, he shared with them the whole counsel of God and he designed his ministry in such a way that people would know what God has said. So when we come to a passage like this, we're reminded and warned of the significance and the importance of spiritual leaders. And I hope that you would pray for the elders of this church. I hope that you would pray for the leadership of, of uh, the Capital C Church. I, I hope that you would recognize the, uh, the weightiness of these things. But the leaders failed and the people suffered. Look at verses 14 and 15. They have become, the people have become like lepers. Now they grope through the streets as if they were blind. They're so defiled with blood that no one dares to touch their garments. Go away, you're unclean, people cry to them. Away, away, don't touch us. When they flee and wander about, people among the nations say they can stay here no longer. The people of God have went from being an attractive people that would, people would take note and they would glorify God on account of them. And they have so fallen that now the nations look on them and they go, we want nothing to do with you. What a startling warning. This is actually the opposite of what another prophet said in Zechariah chapter 8, verse 23. He said, here's, here's what's going to happen when the people of God are doing what they're supposed to. Um, he says, people from all different places, languages, nations, they will come and they will cling to the people of God. They will hold on to their robe and they will, say, they will say things like this, let us go with you for we heard that God is with you. That's what it's supposed to look like. That people are saying, I want to be wherever you're at because you obviously have God. And that should be something that we aspire to as the church, that we should be a people who are so connected to God that the watching world is magnetized to us and they just say, I'm just, I just want to be with you because I recognize that the spirit of God is with you. But the opposite has happened here. What we find is that the people look on them and they go, away from me. You have become contaminated. You are defiled. You are unclean. God's protection then is gone. Verse 16, the Lord himself has scattered them. He no longer watches over them. The priests are shown no honor, the elders no favor. And no one can help. Verse 17, moreover, our eyes failed. Looking in vain for help from our towers, we watched for a nation that could not save us. This is so dumb. Uh, what they were doing was, as they were assuming their privileged status, nobody could ever touch us. Nobody's ever going to get us. We're the people of God. We've got his name. We've got his temple. We've got his presence. We've got all these different benefits. We're fine. And then as the threats are bearing down on them, what do they do? They go up in their watchtowers. And they're looking out, and they're like, well, when is our rescuer going to come? Let's send, let's, and they did this over and over again throughout their history. They're like, what if we conscripted another neighboring military force from Egypt or another place, and then we would have a formidable help, and we could go to battle, and we could win these wars. 
but they're watching in vain. They're looking in vain for help from their towers, watching for a nation that could not save them. Psalm 127 puts it like this. It says, unless the Lord watches over a city, the guards stand watch in vain. And that's what the people of God were doing, looking from their tower, thinking rescue's going to come from somewhere else. And they did not look to the Lord. Isaiah says the same thing in Isaiah 31. He says, woe to those who go down to Egypt for help, who rely on horses, who trust in the multitude of their chariots and their great strength and their horsemen, but do not look to the Holy One of Israel or seek help from the Lord. That is the MO of a sinful, unbelieving heart. Instead of going to God, we have this awful tendency to try to solve things on our own with the help of others. And we look on the horizon and we wonder, okay, where's the help going to come from? And it, we fail to recognize we could look to God. We could turn to him. He could be our strong tower and our refuge. How foolish. Verse 18, people stalk us at every step so we could not walk in our streets. Our end was near. Our days were numbered for our end had come. Our pursuers were swifter than eagles in the sky. They chased us over the mountains and lay in wait for us in the desert. So the people of God have come to this conclusion. We have suffered on account of our negligence of God and our end is here. And they experience the fullness of that in real time, in that judgment. But then notice in verse 20, the Lord's anointed, our very life breath, was caught in their traps. We thought that under his shadow, we would live among the nations. And you hear it here. You hear this kind of lament and this agony over the loss of their king, the Lord's anointed. And Old Testament scholar Paul House, he, he pointed out that the metaphor must mean that the people felt that their lives were bound up with the monarch, with the, with the king. And uh, when, they, when the king got captured, here they are saying, our very life breath, this one that we had so much hope for, was caught in their traps, and we thought that under his shadows, we would live among the nations. And I was wrestling with that this week. I was like, you know what? I don't know why they were so sad that their king got caught. This morning, I was doing my personal devotions, and it was actually the, uh, the narrative of that event, the king that got captured. And the truth of the matter is, if you read it for yourself, that king was a bum. He was not a good king. And they knew it. They, I mean, the Bible says so. He's just not a good king. He, has, he doesn't have the interest of the people in mind. He doesn't pursue the things of God. He's just not a good king. So when he gets captured and they carry him off in chains and they pluck out his eyes, it's actually kind of surprising to me that they were sad because they should have thought this guy had it coming. He was no good to anybody or for any reason. And so here they, they're saying this, the Lord's anointed has been captured. He's our very lifeblood. And I was wrestling with, why? Why did they feel so strongly about this king? And I started to realize the reason why they would care so much about the king is because there are so many promises and expectations bound up with him. That the king is supposed to be this Davidic king who will accomplish for them all kinds of promises of God. And here, their king is actually being carted off in captivity, and they're feeling the hopelessness and the despair of it. Who's going to rescue us now? If the line of David is in jeopardy, we may never see another Davidic king. If, if, if this is our outcome, we thought that we would rest under the shadow of his leadership and live among the nations, and our king is gone. And I, what I was recognizing is their hope is accurate. Their longing is accurate. Their desire to have a king to rescue them is accurate. They just haven't located where it needs to land. It's Jesus Christ that they are anticipating and hoping for. And even when Jesus Christ comes, there's still confusion over his leadership and over the things that he's doing. And so Jesus is doing his, his ministry and he's fulfilling promises of God, but his followers don't get it. They, they're thinking, okay, I know all these promises are going to come true. I just can't imagine how it's going to play out because you don't really fit the mold of what we think you should be doing. Maybe you'll establish your throne and your kingdom and you'll get an army together, but look at us. We're like fishermen and we, we don't know how to do all this stuff that needs to be done. And so then he gets arrested and executed. And the people, the disciples themselves, they're just, 
they're, they're losing their minds. And we catch up with them, actually, in Luke chapter 24. We find a couple of them walking down a road, kicking rocks, just, you know, thinking, like, this is the worst. We had all this hope and all this expectation, and now it's dashed. It's gone. And Jesus is resurrected, and he comes up beside them, but they don't recognize him. So Jesus is walking with the disciples. They're talking along the road to Emmaus, and Jesus is asking questions. Hey, what's going on with you guys? Why are you so bummed? They're like, do you live under a rock? Have you not heard what's been going on around here? Haven't you heard of Jesus, of Nazareth, and what happened with him? And they say this, we had hoped, we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. We thought he was our guy, and now he's dead. And you know what he says? Hey, dummies, it's me. He breaks bread with them, and he opens their eyes, and they see the hope of Israel, the hope of glory, the hope of redemption is right before their eyes. They had an expectation for how things were going to play out. It didn't match up with how God performed it. But in Christ, we have the king. We have the king who is willing to suffer defeat so that he could redeem a people to himself. We have a king who loved us to the uttermost. He was willing to go to the cross and suffer and die so we could experience the hope of glory. We had hope that under his shadow, we would live among the nations, but then it looks like he gets defeated. But what happens, as a matter of fact, is he is disarming the powers that be. He is winning the victory over sin, death, and the devil. Through his glorious cross work, he is making a people for himself. And so, when the author is writing this lament and kind of wondering, how did this happen? How did the Lord's anointed get overwhelmed in this way? What we can look now and see is that hope is, is finding fulfillment in the person and work of Jesus Christ. So third and finally, we come to this limitation in verses 21 and 22. And what it's saying is, people of God, your your suffering and what you're going through is not a permanent thing. So you can take hope. So he turns to Edom and he says to them, you can have your party today, but uh, it's not going to last forever. Rejoice and be glad, daughter Edom, you who live in the land of Uz. But to you also the cup will be passed. You will be drunk and stripped naked. So to a neighboring place that's kind of laughing over the calamity of the people of God, he says, yeah, you can have your party, but just know that the cup that we were drinking from, it's coming your way. And it's this recognition that is beginning to show up in the book of Lamentations and in other places as well, that God will make all things right. That he is able to take places like Edom or Babylon or Assyria, or any place, and he's able to accomplish his purposes through them. But one day, he's going to call all nations to account, and everyone will have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and he says, you, you guys can have your party today, but that cup is going to be passed over to you, and you will, be, you will be drunk and stripped naked as well. But to you, people of God, daughter Zion, your punishment will end. He will not prolong your exile but he will punish your sin, daughter Edom, and expose your wickedness. So he says to the people of God, there is a limit. As bad as this is, it is not a permanent arrangement. God has already told us, Jeremiah told us in chapter 29 of his his prophecy, it'll be 70 years. That's a long time. And he actually says, you better post up, build some houses, plant vineyards, get settled in. It's going to be 70 years. But it is not permanent. God will restore his people to glory. And so we take hope then in the goodness of God, in his character, and in his ability to see his promises through to the very end. So as we take Lamentations chapter 4 and we go, okay, what, Cor, what does this mean for us? What are we talking about today? A couple things that I want to draw your attention to in closing. Lamentations chapter 4 and the entire book itself, it reminds us that life is, in a fallen world can be far worse than you can even imagine. And some of you are going through it right now and you can you nod your head in agreement. Life in a in a fallen and sin sinful world can be 
far worse than you can even imagine. And that's why we have books like Lamentations, so we have solidarity with the suffering people of God. But we also learn that there is hope in Christ, that in Christ, God's purposes will come true. He is rescuing and redeeming a people for himself. That in Christ, Jesus is taking on the punishment of sin. That on, him, on his body at the cross, he was bearing the curse of sin so that we by faith could receive not the anger of God, not the, the judgment of God, but we could receive the grace of God. And he could gift us with eternal life and the hope of glory so though life is hard and suffering can be agonizing, we look to our Savior with faith and hope in the work that he has accomplished for us. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you would help each and every one of us to recognize the beauty of the Savior. That even in the midst of a broken world, there is a way to see how you are reconciling the world to yourself through your Son. Lord, thank you for the gift of eternal life, the gift of salvation. I pray that every person that can hear my voice right now, that all of us would turn in faith and trust in the finished work of what Christ has done for us. And we pray that that would give us hope and resilience so that we might live for his glory. We pray in his name. Amen.